Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, having discussed the 40-year term in the uh, national competitions of all the soccer entities of uh, the Hunter with Neil Jamison, I'm here with Gary Van Egmont and we celebrate uh, 10 years uh, since that fantastic day down at the Sydney Football Stadium when uh, the Jets beat the Mariners uh, in the grand final to bring the first championship um, home to the Hunter region. So. Welcome to Gary, um, mate. Just for the uh, some people in the audience may not know, you're a very successful player. Started off as a left winger, I can remember in the days of the RPA youth team, but ended up as a man marker and played very well for Australia. At that time, did you always have the feeling that you wanted to coach? No, not at all. Um, I remember going to Knox Grammar, and there was opportunities there where a number of the Marconi boys used to go up there and coach and we actually got interviewed, you know, JP, Swartzer, Ocon, um, we used to go up there, Tommy, we used to go up there and, and, and do a bit of coaching for, for Knox Grammar and we actually got interviewed and I didn't have the patience and, and, and the other part was I didn't have the expertise and uh, I never really thought it was going to um, be the career that I, I've sort of obviously forged. Um, it, it more or less started uh, with Northern Spirit and Graham Arnold rang me and said, uh, he goes, Dutchy, do you want to come and play for us? I said, listen, Arnie, my, uh, my calves are you know, they're shot. Uh, I've got compartment syndrome, I'd, I'd be just taking your money. And he rang me about two weeks later and he said, oh, what about if you want to come and coach the youth team? And I thought about it and obviously, you know, as, a, as you go, get older as a player, you, you think to yourself, well, I want to stay involved in the game and how do you do that? So I thought, all right, well, I'll give this a crack. And uh, I still apologise to some of those players now for what I did to them. <laughs> Um, they were fit, but uh, yeah. were running up hills and everything that obviously you as a player felt that you were good at, you started to do as a, as a coach. I don't know, there's a few hip replacements happened or whatever it might be, but um, you know, that's where it started and um, it sort of obviously took off from there. Okay, so you had a successful <laughs> couple of years um, at that time. I can remember a couple of uh, clashes with a certain Newcastle side that I coach and I think we uh, we ended up losing to you 1-0 in the minor semi-final. I've never forgiven Brad Swancott for dropping, <laughs> dropping the ball on that day. But um, you had an early opportunity, not long after that, I mean, probably a year or two after that, um, with the Jets, which, um, which came about after a poor start to a season with uh, Nick Theodorakopoulos, who was the coach then. I mean, you'd had a, a year up there before, <coughs> um, when it was still Newcastle United, mm. a year or two with Ian Crook. Um, came, came at just the right time for you? Yeah, it really did, and uh, it was basically, um, and Remen Ongarotto was our um, director of football, and uh, he, he, he pulled me aside and said, listen, uh, we're going to get Frank Farina in, but um, we'll have you for, for the next three, three rounds. Go and find someone uh, to go and help you out, and um, just try and do as well as you can. So we had New Zealand Kings, and I had my daughter, Emily, training with Enswe, so I knew Jonesy is the only coach I really knew within the whole of Newcastle, so I said, do you fancy a gig? We can't pay you a great deal. You can keep your Enswe's job as well. So that helped him out a little bit uh, uh, on the financial side of things, but um, we just started off and uh, we had success against New Zealand Kings. I think it was nil all to about the 70th minute. I'm thinking, well, this is going to be the shortest tenure ever. And uh, uh, we ended up winning 3-0 and we, we then went up to Brisbane and um, Brisbane were flying then under uh, under Mirren, um, under Mirren, yeah. And uh, we beat them one nil. And then we we came back, and that was a night where Harry Kuehl came to, to town, and um, I think we played Adelaide, and I think it was one all. And I think uh, I'm not too sure who it was. Someone had a shot, and Jado was on the line, and he saved it, and he got sent off. And I'm thinking, oh well, you know, we've had a bit of a crack. And um, anyway, um, Carl Veard, I think, skied the penalty, and next thing. Nicky Carla scored that one goal and we go on and win 2-1 and the hierarchy said, listen, uh, we're going to give you the, the gig for the rest of the year. Yeah, very good. Now, the hierarchy, you talk about the hierarchy. <laughs> How was the relationship with Con? It couldn't be probably the easiest relationship you've ever managed in your life, I wouldn't imagine, particularly when he signed um, twice European golden boot Mario <laughs> Jardel. For me, that was one of um, the features, one of the highlights of your your management rather than your coaching maybe to keep Con happy about that one to show some respect to, to Mario Jardel who'd obviously been a great footballer but to also keep him out of the team. 
Yeah, look, it wasn't an easy one. And Mario, look, he was a super guy. And you can see there was glimpses of training you saw of how good he was. But, you know, he was just basically shot. And, uh, you know, Con wanted him here and he'd already signed him. And I remember him saying, you know, Gary, son, you know, you have to be at Adamstown Sports Ground. And uh, so we, uh, so we, we rocked up. I had no idea what was going on. Remo just said, just go with it. And uh, anyway, Mario got introduced and signed as basically the marquee. And look, you know, he got to, he had some injuries, so that helped us in regards to doing well. And, and because we we're doing well, um, that took the, that took a lot of pressure off us uh, from the from the position of having to play him. But again, you know, you know, obviously, Com wanted him to play, and 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 to be honest with you, he could do what he'd done previously. You, everyone wanted him to play, but he, um, yeah, he he just wasn't in any shape for for him to be able to do that. And he understood. And at the end of it, I think Con saw that in the end and it actually really was fairly pivotal in that year because it enabled us to get uh, young uh, Songer in from, from Korea and he went out and, and, and Song came in and, and obviously added a real spark at a time where we, we needed something a little bit different as well and uh, it, it worked, both ways worked really, really well for us. So um, that, that's sort of how that all transpired. But, Look, I, I got along with Con really well. I'd, I'd known Con previously um, we, when I was just repping for Pepsi, and he was at Parkley Markets, and we used to haggle over a price of a slab of <laughs> slab of Pepsi and how much you you want to buy it for and how much you're going to sell it. So we'd already had somewhat of a relationship, and um, I, I knew Con very well, and Con was very good to me, and he stood by me, especially when there was the turnover from NSL to, to A League. He he was very good to me in in ensuring I had employment as well. So um, I, I had a I had a good um, relationship with Con, um, but again, you know, there, there was obviously issues where there were certain things that occurred which would normally not occur in, in normal practice. And I'd have to say George Liolo was very good in in being a buffer in, at those moments. Um, George was very good in as far as a CEO was concerned. He he really acted rather than reacted to situations. And then after him, John Tatsmas came in, who, who was also as equally as good. So I was very lucky. I had the um, good support from CEOs. Well, you mentioned Songer and obviously Mario. And it was that year, and it's 10 years ago, and we celebrate that here tonight. What are your special memories of the season? Uh, you know, the players, the moments, um, the whole kit and caboodle, if you like. It was a great year. Yeah, it was. You know, I mean, it was back when uh, there was only eight teams as well, so you had to make a, a top four. And look, we'd, we'd actually had a really, really good end of the year of 2006, 2007. And I thought we were a bit, a bit stiff not getting into that grand final. We went down on pens to, to Adelaide away. And I'll be honest with you, I actually think that's, that was probably a better squad and a better team overall. Um, I thought we played better football as well. And then the, the, the following year, um, we'd lost a few players, you know, um, it, it made it a little bit more, more difficult for us. But uh, we still had the nucleus of that squad and um, the momentum that we had from that year going into um, the 2007, 2008 was, was really good. We had stability in regards to the coaching ranks. So, um, you know, it, it, was, it was really beneficial for us for that first instance to have that uh, consistency of, of familiarity, if you like. The next part was um, uh, looking at the, the players coming in, um, and again, I thought we, we, we recruited quite well from, from, from that perspective. Probably not as well as what we'd done previously, but we still recruited quite well. Um, and then, you know, from that, that year, we we're always hovering around that top four, top three. I, I remember the last round of the, the season when um, I think Sydney had to win, uh, or Melbourne had to win, I wasn't too sure. But we ended up finishing second. And I thought, because we'd finished second, we'd got two bites at the cherry. And I thought that was going to be very, very pivotal for us to try and win the, win the comp. And the, the most thing that stands out, you obviously had the season. And, you know, I think there was a couple of players that had stellar seasons in there. Obviously, namely, you know, Joel Griffiths, who was golden boot. And I think he won the Johnny, Johnny Warren medal as well. So um, there, there was a number of, of, of really good um, performances across that whole year. But... Within that final series, um, you know, we, we played Central Coast and we won 2-0 and I knew we didn't play well and we sort of got away with it a little bit. And I knew we were going to be in a tough game in, in the, in, in, in the uh, following, following match that we had to play. And um, we went down 3-0 and obviously Central Coast went in and after that game I'd, I'd already, I'd, I sort of tapped Jonesy on, the, on his leg and I said, I know how to beat them, but we've just got to beat now Queensland. So we got through that and, and then, you know, 
we obviously went to three at the back, which we never played all year, but they played with two up front. So we had to do something a little bit different to throw them off their game and something they didn't expect. So that, that and, and look, as a coach, sometimes you take a punt and, uh, and the punt paid off. All right, from the highs of 2007, 2008, the following year, um, <coughs> bit of a dispersion of the squad, if you like, <laughs> uh, results at the opposite end of the spectrum. And um, you ended up going to the AOS, I think, in that year. And, um, you know, can you tell us the difference between managing, um, you know, a football club that's, you know, at the top of the A-League table to going into a job where you're working with youngsters all the time, the, the different pressures and the different aspects that you had to, to, to take, take hold of to do with it when you went down to sunny Canberra. Yeah, sunny Canberra. Mm. Um, look, it, it, yeah, it was a shame that it ended that way, uh, but where I had some control in the first couple of years, I had really basically no control come the, the next year. And, and the problem was what was promised to a number of players fell through and once that occurs and you lose trust and you lose trust in any relationship uh, it all goes downhill and it made it very difficult plus on the on the positive side a number of our players got identified to go to greener pastures so you know I think the uh, you know Joel going over to China and I think Jado had an opportunity to go overseas um, we lost Stewie and, and Bridgie which which made it very very difficult uh, Ante Kovic I think left as well so we lost the mainstay of those those players and what we didn't do well is have already a database of, well, if this one goes, what's going to happen? We had no backup plan. You know, we're still too, too ad hoc in a number of our areas, and one would definitely was um, recruitment and, and, and retention. So we needed to be better in that, but we weren't. And, and then I had an opportunity to go to the AS, and, and I'll be honest with you, when I was coaching the, the first couple of years at Newcastle, you know, I'm thinking to myself, is this it? Is this, this, this is all you have to do, you know, type of thing? And I thought there has to be more to it. And so an opportunity came from the FFA to go down to Canberra and, and basically it was more or less a, a two and a half sabbatical in regards to what you need to do from a coaching point of view. Um, and again, it was a, a chance to, to work with the best kids all a, a, across the country uh, in, a, in a really centralised program. And, and to be honest, I really thought I'd, I'd like to do that. Never went there as a player, always wanted to go there as a player, but now I went there as a coach and I just wanted to experience that and see what that was like. Uh, and the other part of it was, was that I just felt I was losing control. I had a four-year deal at Newcastle, and I, and I love Newcastle. I've never coached anywhere else other than an A-League in regards to Newcastle. And I never wanted to leave, but I just couldn't see where the, where the light at the end of the tunnel was going to be. And um, uh, going down there, I, I learned a lot about football. I learned a lot about um, <clears throat> the maximising service providers to help football. Um, and again, as you said, the, the differences between uh, young players and, and, and older players, how, how much you play for a win in comparison to development and the, the score is important but how far that is important and what the balance of that is. Uh, again from you know technical development against um, an individual looking at an individual more so than a, than a team. So there was a lot of good things that I, I learned from um, the AAS and I was you know I was pretty fortunate to work with a coach like Jan Vaslan, um, who was who was excellent at that, at that time. Well, I'll glance down at my sheet and you've touched on broken promises, so I might skip, skip the one on the Tinkler era. <laughs> um, we'll go straight to, you went from there, from, uh, you know, whatever happened with Newcastle with Nathan Tinkler to the emerging Jets. And um, I know it's a big um, issue of interest to a lot of people in our audience of football lovers. Um, had a couple of years there developing the youth. Um, it's always seemed from, to me from the outside of, an area where we have problems, where not everybody pulls on the same rope, and without putting words in your mouth, it, you experience any of that side of things. What, what, what's missing, in your opinion, from a good development pathway, or is it in fact a good development pathway? Look, I think it's a tough one. Whenever you, you, you know, and let's be honest, we we don't have the numbers in in comparison to a, a Sydney and and what have you. Obviously, from your period of when you were coming through Newcastle, first of all, you were playing in the top competition. And competition's a major part of development. And, you know, we, we stopped playing in the Sydney comp. I thought that was a, that's a big hindrance for, for the development of the kids. Um, the, the other part is uh, f from, from the perspective of how we look at um, high, high performance in, in young kids, of how we, how we develop those, those players and develop coaches to, to coach those players. I still don't think we have enough 
high performance coaches at that level to, to cater for some of those for those um, for those teams and to see how we can maximise the, the players coming through. And com like I said, competition and, and, and coaching, the two C's are so paramount for, for the development of the, the, the players coming through. I just feel like we have at under 11, under 10, as good of kids anywhere across Australia. And then what is the difference for those kids between that age and coming through? Um, I, I, I just, you know, I just don't see that we get maybe as good as coaching. We don't have numbers. And I think we've got to really look at the way in which we want the teams to play. So we talk about the curriculum. The curriculum is just a guide. You know, we need to we need to start talking about you know what we want you know players to do in the front third and play with a bit more freedom and play out of position. And it it, it, it just became so regimented for a number of coaches because they go through their C licences and B licences. And even that, from my perspective, is another area where we need to overhaul what the coaches are learning. So these are the coaches that are going to be you know, taking some of our best players through uh, their journey. So, you know, I think there's a, a whole combination of, of that. And, and then again, what's everyone's role and responsibility within um, the football fraternity, you know? So you've got your technical director, you've got academy director, you've got a skill acquisition uh, person who's in charge of that. And how do we manage all of that? And how do we get the best out of that? So that's that part. And then the, the, the other part is to grow the base. So we're talking about 16 kids that we identify at a certain age and there's no underpinning program of, of such which really look to, to, to see how we can go to high performance. So, you know, we've got to, there's got to be some sort of gap, um, so, so some sort of uh, stop gap between um, an emerging JEX program and, and the NPL. And how do, we, how do we start to look to see we combine some more of the kids in the NPL because you can't tell me that 11 and 12, it's already done and dusted. There's plenty of really, really good kids out there and, it, and at all different times they start to come to fruition and we, we need to be able to broaden that so these kids have been able to train in a decent environment so technically they're proficient that coming in, yeah, okay, there's going to be some differences but they've got an opportunity to grow because we're just specialising way, way too soon. Okay, so you were telling me off air that you've just resigned from your job as New South Wales Football as director, technical director. Um, I don't know if that's the official title, but I think we get the drift. Yeah. You've now got a full-time gig with the Matildas program. Um, I'll tie that in with the, the last question I've got written down here for you. Um, so you're at the Matildas now. What do you see in the future uh, for Gary Van Egmond? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I've been very, 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 very lucky to be able to be involved with uh, senior men, uh, youth development, um, from academy director. Now I've been obviously with the Matildas and young Matildas. Uh, technical director of New South Wales. So it's been really, I've been very, very fortunate to be able to experience all of these, these roles. Um, I think what you've got to look to see is there's, there's part of you that goes, hey, I, I really think I'm, I enjoy this the most and I'm fantastic at that. And then you, your other side of your brain's going, well, hold on a minute, you idiot. You're really good at this and you, you should concentrate on that a little bit more. So um, it, it's, it, it is an inter interesting uh, dilemma, but Look, I, I'm really enjoying the job that I have at this moment um, in with the Matildas and, and now being in a centralised program for you know, 15 to 20 year old girls coming in and looking to see how we can get more Matildas coming through and, and, and making sure that the succession plan for the girls is not going to be in a position where the, the men have sort of had that golden era where we had you know, the Aloysies and Moors and Muskets and, and these ones and Zelliches and Ocons and you know, we, we had this real golden era if you like uh, where you know we're going through that a little bit now with the girls so it's important now that we we look to see how we can fill that gap or otherwise we could be in the same boat with the with with the girls and you know they're, they're currently fourth in the world so we, we've got some work to do there's a lot of investment going on around the world so it's great that the FFA have decided to to invest in 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 a program like this but I'm, I'm very comfortable where it is look maybe a change later on down the park but uh, down the track sorry but at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable where I am. Well, Gary Van Engwan, it's 10 years since Newcastle won a title. It may, that means it's also 10 years since I last had a four-figure win at the TAB. <laughs> so I thank you for that and thank you for your time today, mate. All the best. Cheers, Louie.